Hello everyone, welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology, Chapter 18, which focuses on body composition and nutrition for health. The objectives of this chapter are to 1. Describe the recommended range for the dietary intake of carbohydrates, fats, and protein. 2. To describe what is meant by the terms recommended daily allowance, or RDA, and dietary reference intakes, DRIs, and how they relate to the daily value used in food labeling. 3. To list the classes of nutrients. 4. To identify fat and water-soluble vitamins, describe what toxicity is, and identify which class of vitamins is more likely to cause this problem. 5. Contrast major minerals with trace minerals and describe the role of calcium, iron, sodium in health and disease. 6. Identify the primary role of carbohydrates, the two major classes, and the recommended changes in the American diet to improve health status. 7. Identify the primary role of fat and the recommended changes in the American diet to improve health status. 8. To describe the common dietary recommendations from the major health-related organi organizations. 8. To describe the dietary approaches to stop hypertension eating plan. 9. Describe the limitation of the height weight tables and the body mass index in determining overweight and obesity. 10. Provide a brief description of the following methods of measuring body composition. Isotope dilution, photon or exoptometry, potassium-40, hydrostatic underwater weighing, dual energy x-ray absorptometry, near-infrared interactance, radiography, ultrasound, nuclear magnetic resonance, total body electrical conductivity, bioelectrical impedance analysis, air displacement plasmography, and skin fold thickness. 11. Describe the two-component model of body composition and the assumptions made about the density values for the fat-free mass and the fat mass. Contrast this with the multi-component model. 12. Explain the principle underlying the measurement of the whole body density with underwater weighing and why one must correct for residual volume. 13. Explain why there is an error of 2% in the calculation of the percentage of body fat with the underwater weighing technique. 14. Explain how a sum of skin folds can be used to estimate a percentage of body fatness value. 15. List the recommended percentage of body fatness values for health and fitness for males and females and explain the concern for both high and low values. 16. Explain how deaths from cardiovascular disease have decreased while the prevalence of obesity has increased. 18. Distinguish between obesity due to hyperplasia of fat cells and obesity due to hypertrophy of fat cells. 19. Describe the role of genetics and environment in the development of obesity. And 20. Explain the set point theory of obesity and give an example of the physiological and behavioral control system. This is going to be a long chapter, so here is an outline to follow if you are taking notes. The major topics include nutritional guidelines, standards of nutrition, class of nutrients, meeting the guidelines and achieving the goals, body composition, obesity and weight control, and finally diet, exercise, and weight control. We're going to start with the Institute of Medicine Dietary Recommendations from 2002. We see that 45 to 65 percent of the calories are recommended from carbohydrates, 20 to 35 percent of the calories from fat, with infants and younger children needing a higher proportion of fat, approximately 25 to 40 percent, and the recommended 10 to 35 percent from protein. Now if we look at excerpts from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans in 2005, we see that they consume a variety of nutrient-dense foods and beverages within and among the basic food groups. Cho chooses foods that limit the intake of saturated and trans fats, cholesterol, added sugar, salts, and alcohol, and maintain body weight in a health range. This involves the balance of calories from foods and beverages with calories expended and engage in regular physical activity and reduce sedentary activities. Now the themes from the dietary guidelines for the Americans in 2010 are balancing calories to manage weight, food and food components to reduce, foods and nutrients to increase, and building healthy eating patterns. Now looking at the Institute of Medicine report, we see that the, it was established the RDA for carbohydrates, which are approximately 130 grams per day, which meets the glucose needs of the brain. 
Now if we look at the AI, the adequate intake for fiber set, we see that 38 grams per day in men and 25 grams per day in women is what is recommended. Again, the adequate intake for linic acid, the omega-6 fatty acid, is 17 grams per day in men and 12 grams per day in women. Also, the adequate intake for a linoleic acid, which is omega-3 fatty acid, is 1.6 grams per day in men and 1.1 grams per day in women. Now if we look at the maintained adult protein requirement, it is approximately 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day. And the adequate intake for water set is 3.7 liters per day for men and 2.7 liters per day for women. In summary, current recommendations for the distribution of calories and foods include a broad range rather than a single goal. Carbohydrates range from 45 to 60 percent, 65 percent. Fats range from 20 to 35 percent and proteins range from 10 to 35 percent. The publication Dietary Guidelines for Americans has been revised over time to reflect the new science and to deal with the nutrition and physical activity and health related issues. The 2005 edition provided recommendations to meet the 2002 IOM nutritional standards with special focus on achieving energy balance. The 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans emphasized what would reduce and add to our diet to improve health. Now looking at the dietary reference intakes or the DRIs, we see that the quantity of nutrients needed for the proper function of health. The recommended daily allowances is the quantity of each need, nutrient need to meet the needs of nearly all, which are 97 to 98 percent of healthy persons. The adequate intakes, like we mentioned, are the recommended daily intake based on apparently healthy people. There's also a tolerable upper intake level, which is the highest intake level that is likely to pose no risk, as well as an estimated average requirement, which is the intake estimated to meet the requirements of half of the healthy people. Now when we discuss standards of nutrition, we'll look at the estimated energy requirement, or the EER, which is the average dietary energy intake predicted to maintain energy balance considering age, gender, weight, height, and level of physical activity. There's also a daily value, which is a standard used in nutritional labeling. This percentage of recommended intake in each serving, which is based on a 2,000 kilocalorie per diet day. Now looking at nutritional labeling, we see that food labels contain the serving size information, the total calories and fat calories, the total fat grams, saturated fat grams, cholesterol, and the percentage of the daily value for each based on a 2,000 calorie diet, the total carbohydrates and its sources, as well as the percent of daily values for the vitamins and minerals like vitamins A and C, calcium and iron, and sodium is given special attention. In this diagram you'll see the nutritional information on food packages we just discussed. In summary, the recommended, recommended dietary allowance is the quantity of a nutrient that will meet the needs of almost all healthy persons. The daily value is a standard unit used in nutritional labeling. Now talking about water, it is absolutely essential for life, and loss of only 3-4% to 4 of water, body water affects performance. Water loss is approximately 250 milliliters per day, and temperature and exercise can increase water loss to 6-7 to 7 liters per day. When we look at water intake, it comes from beverages, approximately 1,500 milliliters, solid foods, 750 milliliters, metabolic processes, such as approximately 250 milliliters, and the AI is 2.7 liters per day for women and 3.7 liters per day for men. Moving on to vitamins, there are two types. We have fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K, and can be stored in the body. Excess intake, however, can be toxic. There's also water-soluble vitamins, such as the B vitamins, such as thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, peroxidine, folic acid, panothenic acid, and biotin. These are all involved in energy metabolism. And there's also vitamin C for maintenance of bone, cartilage, and connective tissue. For a summary of vitamin C, table 18.1. In summary, fat-soluble vitamins include A, D, E, and K. These can be stored in the body in large quantities and toxicity can develop. The water-soluble vitamins include the B vitamins and vitamin C. Most of these are involved in energy metabolism. Also, vitamin C is involved in the maintenance of bone, cartilage, and connective tissue.
Now if we move on to the classes of nutrients and focus on minerals, we see that there are major minerals and trace elements. The major minerals are calcium, sodium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, potassium, and chloride. The trace elements include iron, iodine, fluoride, zinc, copper, cobalt, chromium, magnesium, arsenic, nickel, etc. For a summary of the minerals, please see table 18.2. Now looking at minerals such as calcium, it plays an important role in teeth and bone structure and helps prevent osteoporosis. Iron is an important component of hemoglobin and helps prevent anemia. We also see that sodium is associated with hypertension, especially in sodium sensitive individuals. In summary, the major minerals include calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, sodium, potassium, and chloride. In addition, there's a variety of trace elements including iron, iodide, fluoride, zinc, copper, cobalt, etc. Inadequate calcium and iron intake has been linked with osteoporosis as well as anemia respectively. In the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americas, it is recommended an increase in calcium and iron intake to address these problems and a reduction in sodium intake, especially for those at risk of hypertension. Now to talk about carbohydrates, these would be classified under sugars and starches, and they contain approximately 4 kilocalories per gram. They are a major energy source and crucial for red blood cells and neurons. As far as recommendations, choose or prepare foods and beverages with little added sugars or caloric sweeteners. Also, reduce the incidence of dental cares by consuming sugar-containing foods and beverages less frequently. Also, the carbohydrates involve dietary fibers, which are non-digestible carbohydrates these reduce the transit time in the intestine and are soluble fibers linked to lower serum cholesterol. There's also functional fiber, which is a non-digestible carbohydrate, and it has beneficial physiological functions. As far as recommendations, the AI is 38 grams per day for men and 25 grams per day for women. Increasing dietary fiber and complex carbohydrate intake, as well as decreasing simple sugar intake. We want to talk about the glycemic index and what it is and what it is and why it is important. The glycemic index is the blood glucose response over two hours to carbohydrate food. Low GI foods make blood glucose regulation less challenging. There's also a glycemic load. This takes into account the amount of food eaten. It can be used to plan meals as well as improve metabolic control in diabetics and reduce, reduce cholesterol and vascular inflammation. The simplicity complicated by protein and fat in the diet. Fats, important energy sources which contain 9 kilocalories per gram. These would include triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol. Cholesterol is further broken into low-density lipoproteins, which directly relate to cardiovascular disease and increase in diets that are high in saturated fats. There's also high-density lipoproteins, which actually prevent against heart disease. Regarding fats, the recommendations include to consume less than 10% of calories from saturated fats and less than 300 milligrams a day of cholesterol. Also, to keep the total fat intake between 20 and 35 calories, where most fat should come from polyunsaturated and monosaturated fats. Also, choose and prepare meat, poultry, dried beans, milk, and milk products that are lean, low-fat, or fat-free. In addition, Limit the intakes of fat and oils high in saturated and or trans fatty acids. Now looking at dietary composition in Syndrome X, we see a clustering, clustering of risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease risk. These would include hyperinsulinemia, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and obesity. The diet composition may be a contributing factor. What we see is a high-fat, refined sugar diet is associated with insulin resistance and elevated plasma insulin, elevated triglycerides, larger fat cell size, as well as higher blood pressure. This would be compared to a low-fat, complex carbohydrate diet. If we look at proteins, these are not a major source of energy, and they com compose 4 kilocalories per gram. We see high-quality proteins contain 9 essential amino acids that cannot be synthesized by the body. In addition, most Americans actually meet the protein intake requirements of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. These requirements may be higher in athletes. In summary, carbohydrate is the primary source of energy in the American diet and is divided into two classes. 
that which can be metabolized, sugar and starches, and ones that can't, dietary fiber. The two recommendations to improve health status in American population are to consume complex carbohydrates to represent about 45 to 65 percent of the calories and to add more dietary fiber. In addition, Americans consume too much saturated fat and the recommended change is to reduce to no more than 10 percent of the total calories. Trans fat intake should be reduced as much as possible and the most fat intake should come from sources containing polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. The protein requirement of 0.8 grams per kilogram can be met with low fat selections to minimize fat intake. Now looking at meeting the guidelines. The 2005 Dietary Guidelines for Americans describes a healthy diet as one that emphasizes fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and fat-free or low-fat milk and milk products. That includes lean meats, poultry, fish, beans, eggs, and nuts, and is low in saturated fat, trans fat, cholesterol, salt, and added sugars. Now if we look at food group plans, we see common elements among eating plans. We see abundant fruits and vegetables, whole grains, moderate amounts of foods high in protein, limited amounts of foods high in added sugars, more oils than solid fats, and most are low in full fat milk and milk products. However, some having substantial amounts of low fat milk and milk products. If we look at the USDA food pattern, what we see are vegetables, dark green, red and orange, beans and peas and others, fruits, grains, which contain whole grains or enriched grains, diet pro dietary products, emphasis on the low fat choices, and protein foods such as meat, poultry, seafood, egg, nuts, seeds, and soy products, with emphasis again on low fat choices. These are as a table of 18.3, which shows the consistency among the recommendations. Now if we look at the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, we see that it is developed to prevent hypertension and to lower blood pressure in those with hypertension. The healthy eating approach is consistent with good health, which will reduce cardiovascular risk factors and it will achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. If we are evaluating a diet, we would ask the question, how well is someone achieving the guidelines? We would look at a 24-hour recall method and remember what you ate for the previous 24 hours. In addition, we would look at food records where the person records what they eat and they recommend the use of three to four days per week in this record-taking model. In summary, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans identified two major approaches to use to meet the dietary standards and achieve a healthy body weight. The USDA food patterns with adaptations for vegetarians and the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension food plan. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's My Plate promotes a personalized approach to healthy eating and physical activity. Now if we look at methods of assessing overweight and obesity, what we see is the Metropolitan Life Insurance Height and Weight Tables, which are no longer widely used. We also see Body Mass Index, which is the weight in kilograms to the height in meters squared. The classification for adults within the BMI is underweight, normal, overweight, and obesity. There's no way to tell the actual body composition, however, so a very muscular person could be classified as obese. So, more specifically, we would like to look at methods for measuring body composition. This can be done through isotope dilution, which is a measurement of total body water and uses an isotope of water. There's also photon absorptometry, which determines the mineral content and density of bones, potassium-40, which is a measurement of lean tissue, there's hydrostatic weighing, which is a determination of body density, there's also dual energy x-ray absor absorptometry, or DEXA or DEXA, which estimates lean tissue, bone, mineral, and fat. There's an, also a near infrared interactance, which uses infrared light beams, radiography, which is a measurement of fat width, ultrasound, which measures the thickness of subcutaneous fat, nuclear magnetic resonance, which looks at the volumes of spe specific tissues, and total body electrical conductivity, which is the electrical conductivity of lean and fat tissues. In addition, there's bioelectrical impedance analysis, which is the measurement of total body water and fatness. There's also air displacement, plysmography, which is a me measurement of body density using the BOD-POD system, as well as skinfold thickness, 
which estimates the total body fatness. Here is a diagram of the bod pod system. Now looking at the body composition assessment, we look at a four component model which includes mineral, water, protein, and fat. The best estimates are of course the percent fat. There's also a three component model which looks at body water, protein plus mineral and fat, body water plus protein, mineral and fat, and accounts for variations in bone density or body water. The two component model looks at fat mass and fat free mass and is most commonly used method. In summary, BMI uses simple ratio of weight to height squared to classify individuals as being normal weight, overweight, or obese. However, just like the old height weight tables, the BMI does not consider the composition of the body weight, i.e. the proportion of the muscle to fat tissue. Body composition can be measured in terms of total body water through isotope dilution, bioelectric impedance analysis. It can also look through bone density, lean tissue mass, density, and thickness of various tissues. Also, body composition assessments can be based on four components, three components, or two components models. The four component model is the most accurate. Now, if we look more closely at the two component system of body composition, we see the body is divided into fat free and fat mass. Where fat mass, the density is approximately 0.9, and fat free mass, the density is approximately 1.1. We want to look at the measurement of the whole body density. We can use underwater weighing and skin folds. And then the equation to convert the body density to present fat is based on age, gender, and race. And we use the Siri equation. Now by estimating the percentage of fat from body density, we can see that this is listed in table 18.4. It also will include in relation to age as well as gender. Now more specifically we want to discuss underwater weighing where the density is equal to mass over volume. The measurement of body volume is accomplished by the subject being submerged in the tank of water. The weight of the water displaced is equal to the loss of weight when submerged. We also see that the weight of water displaced is divided by the density of the water to calculate the volume of water displaced. In addition, the volume is corrected for residual lung volume and gas and interstitial tract. Here is a diagram of the underwater weighing technique. In summary, the two component system of body composition analysis, the body is divided into fat free and fat mass with densities of 1.1 and 0.9 respectively. The estimate of the density of the fat free mass must account for the differences that exist in various populations i.e. children and African Americans. Continuing, the body density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. Underwater weighing is used to determine body volume using the principles of Archimedes. When an object is placed in water, it is buoyed by the counterforce equal to the water that is displaced. One can measure the actual volume of the water displaced or the loss of the, the weight while underwater. The weight of the water is divided by the density of the water to yield the body volume, which must then be corrected for the residual volume of the volume of gas in the GI tract. Following that, the percent of body fat has an error of about plus or minus 2 to 2.5 percent due to the normal biological variation of fat-free mass. Now looking at skin folds, we have a prediction of body density from an estimation of subcutaneous fat. This is a result of the thickness of subcutaneous fat which is measured. In addition, there are specific sites on the body based on age, gender, and race. The body density is calculated using equations which are generalized or specific equations. In addition, the body fat calculations from the body density are calculated using the Siri equation. In table 18.5, we see the prediction of the percent body fat based on the skin's folds. Please reference your book for this table. Also, we can look at body fatness for health and fitness and look at the recommendations for body fat percentage. For health standards, we see that in men, for young adults, the recommendation is 8 to 22 percent. 
middle-aged 10 to 25 percent, and elderly 10 to 23 percent, while for females and young adults it's 20 to 35 percent, middle-aged is 25 to 38 percent, and the elderly is 25 to 35 percent. Now increasing the fitness standard of the measurements, we see that men, for young adults, it's 5 to 15 percent, the middle age is 7 to 18 percent, and the elderly is 9 to 18 percent. In addition, for women, the standard for young adults is 16 to 28 percent, the middle age is 20 to 23 percent, and the elderly is 20 to 33 percent. Continuing with the body fatness for health and fitness, we see that health concer concerns occur above and below these values. For above, we have obesity, and below, we have anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Here is an equation that you can use for a calculation of optimal weight. In summary, subcutaneous fat can be quote-unquote sampled as skin fold thickness, and the sum of the skin folds can be converted to a percent body fat with formulas derived from the relationship of the sum of the skin folds to body composition standards based on two, three, and four component models. The recommended body fatness for males is 8 to 22 percent, and for females it is 20 to 35 percent. The values for fitness are 5 to 15 percent and 16 to 28 percent, respectively. Looking at obesity, however, there are several diseases linked to it. There is hypertension, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea and respiratory problems, as well as some cancers which would be endometrial, breast, prostate and colon, and other health conditions. The prevalence of overweight and obesity in U.S. adults from 2007 to 2008 is 33% of individuals are obese. We also see that 68% of individuals are overweight. This includes those classified as obese. This is higher in some ethnic groups than others, however. Also, if we look at the distribution of body fat, it is important. There's a higher risk of cardiovascular disease with abdominal obesity. This would include a waist circumference of greater than 102 centimeters in men and 88 centimeters in women, and a waist to hip ratio of greater than 0.95 in men and 0.8 in women. Now moving on, if we look at fat cell size versus number in obesity, we see that 25 billion fat cells in a normal weight individual compared to 60 to 80 billion in an obese individual. During weight loss, the fat cell size decreases, not the fat cell number. In severe obesity, a fat mass greater than 30 kilograms, this is due to an increase in the fat cell number, which is called hyperplasia. In less severe obesity, which is due to an increase in fat cell size, this is called hypertrophy. In hyperplasia, we see that it is associated with a greater difficulty losing weight and maintaining weight loss. This graph below shows the relationship between fat cell size and fat cell number to the total body fat. Now looking at the causes of obesity, we see that there are gen genetic factors that account for about 25% of the transmissible variance for fat mass in the body fat percentage. It also affects the components of energy expenditure, which would be the amount of spontaneous physical activity, the resting metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food, and the relative rate of carbohydrate and fat oxidation. There are also cultural factors that account for approximately 30% of the cause of obesity. In summary, obesity is associated with an increased mortality from cardiovascular disease and some types of cancer, but being overweight is not. Emphasis should be put on maintaining or reducing weight in an overweight individual to decrease the chance of migration to the obese category. Obesity, obesity associated with fat mass in excess of 30 kilograms is due primarily to an increase in fat cell number, with fat cell hypertrophy being related to smaller degrees of obesity. Those with hyperplasia have more difficult time losing weight and keeping it off. Genetic factors, however, account for about 25% of the transmissible variance for fat mass and percent body fat, and culture accounts for approximately 30%. Now, if we look at the set point in obesity, we see that the set point theory is a biological set point for the body weight, much like the set points for other physiological variables. The physiological set point model looks at the biological signals to provide input to the hypothalamus, such as blood glucose, lipid stores, 
and weight on the feet. The food take is either increased or decreased to maintain this body weight. There's also a cognitive set point model where cognitive signal signals about perception of body weight. This influences food intake to maintain the body weight as well. The diagram below reflects the psych physiological set point model for control of body weight. And this diagram represents the cognitive set point for the control of body weight. Both of these diagrams are referenced in your book. Now looking at drugs, dietary supplements, and weight loss, there is little evidence that dietary supplements work. And if they do work, they may have side effects. This also is a scene in a supplement called ephedrine that most of you are aware of, and it is associated with adverse effects. Some key points are the focus on weight loss programs should be long-term diet and exercise behaviors. Also, most drugs are for short-term use only. In addition, the use of all diet books, pills, and supplements worked, obesity would not be a problem. So the fact that obesity is increasing shows that most of the supplementation is not working. In summary, investigators have proposed a set point theory to explain obesity given the tendency for people who diet to return to their former weight. Theories based on weight sensors, the blood glucose concentration, and the mass of lipids have been proposed. A behavioral set point theory has been proposed that relies on the person making appropriate activity and dietary judgment when the body weight, size, or shape does not match up with the person's ideal. Moving on to energy balance. We see a static energy balance where there's an increased intake of 250 kilocalories per day which would lead to a 14 pound weight gain over one year. Also looking at a dynamic energy balance, we see an increase in energy intake that results in an increase in body weight where energy expenditure also increases and the weight is maintained at a new higher level. This results in a weight gain of only 3.5 pounds per year. Looking at the equation, Please note that the change of energy store in static energy balance is equal to energy intake minus energy expenditure. And also for the dynamic energy balance, we see the rate of change of energy stores is equal to the rate of change in energy intake minus the rate of change of energy expenditure. In summary, the dynamic energy balance equation correctly expresses the dynamic nature of changes in energy intake and the body weight. An increase in energy intake leads to an increase in body weight. In turn, energy and expenditure increases to eventually match the higher energy intake. Body weight is now stable at a new and higher value. Now moving on to nutrient balance, we look at carbohydrates and proteins. We see that excess intake is oxidized and the body regulates expenditure to match the intake. However, this does not contribute to weight gain. As far as fat, the excess intake is not necessarily oxidized, and fat expenditure depends on the total energy expenditure, which does contribute to weight gain. Now if we look at the food quotient, this is, indicates the mix of carbohydrates and fat in the meal. So 1.0 would be 100% carbohydrate, 0.85 would be 50% carbohydrate, 50% fat, and 0.7 would be 100% fat. This is similar to the respiratory quotient, which indicates the mix of carbohydrates and fats oxidized. Now if we look at the FQ, the RQ, and the nutrient balance, we see that RQ is equal to FQ, which is a nutrient balance. So the RQ divided by the FQ ratio is 0.1. Now if the RQ is greater than the FQ, we are not oxidizing as much fat as is consumed, so the RQ-FQ ratio is greater than 1. Conversely, if the RQ is less than the FQ, we are utilizing more fat than is consumed. So the RQ-FQ ratio is less than 1. Here is a graph representing the relationship between the RQ and the FQ ratio and energy balance. In summary, nutrient balance exists for both protein and carbohydrate. Excess intake is oxidized and is not converted to fat. If we look at the excess fat intake, it does not drive its own oxidation. The excess is stored in adipose tissue. Achieving fat balance is an important part of weight control. Looking at the ratio of food quotient to the respiratory quotient provides a good information about the degree to which the individual is in nutrient balance. Moving on to diet and weight control, we see diets high in fat are linked to obesity. 
where the fat grams contain twice as many calories as carbohydrates. In addition, nutrient balance can most easily be achieved with a low-fat diet. Now, calories count and must be considered, and adherence to the diet is an important type of the diet followed. The calories from food and beverages should be balanced with calories expended. This will gradually decrease caloric intake and increase physical activity. In summary, diets with a high fat-to-carbohydrate ratio are linked to obesity. And the nutrient balance for a fat can be most easily achieved with a low-fat diet or a high FQ. Also, calories do count, and they must be considered in any diet aimed at achieving or maintaining a weight loss goal. Now, looking at energy expenditure and weight control, we see a basal metabolic rate or a BMR. This is the rate of energy expenditure under standardized conditions, which would involve a supine position immediately after rising 12 to 18 hours following a meal. This is similar to a resting metabolic rate. This represents 60 to 75 percent of the total energy expenditure. It does tend to be lower in women and declines with age. It is also related to fat-free mass. In addition, a reduce in response or a reduced caloric intake such as dieting or fasting, and exercise can maintain the basal metabolic rate. The following chart shows the decrease in basal metabolic rate during semi-starvation. In summary, the BMR represents the largest fraction of the total energy expender in sedentary persons. The BMR decreases with age and women have lower BMR values than men. The fat-free mass is related to both the gender difference and to the decline of BMR with age. A reduction in caloric intake by dieting or fasting can reduce the BMR, but physical activity is important in maintaining it. Continuing with the energy expenditure, we also see thermogenesis, which is heat generation, the thermic effect of feeding. This it leads to an increased energy expenditure following ingestion of meals, a small part of the total energy expenditure, which comprises approximately 10 to 15%. However, it is not predictive of obesity. If we look more closely at the brown adipose tissue, we see increases in heat production in response to norepinephrine and thyroid hormones. Also, energy wasteful systems or futile cycles, where we have the metabolic cycles of the sodium potassium pump activity. In summary, thermogenesis, i.e. heat generation, is associated with the ingestion of meals, which is the thermic effect of feeding, brown adipose tissue, and feudal cycles. In addition, the thermic effect of food represents only a small part of the total energy expenditure and is not predictive of obesity. Continuing on for energy expenditure, we see physical activity and exercise. This includes exercise and occupational physical activity. It accounts for anywhere from 5 to 40 percent of the total energy expenditure and depends on an individual's activity level. It is also important for determining obesity. There's an inverse relationship between physical activity and percent fat. So individuals accumulating more than 10,000 steps per day are more likely to be in the normal BMI range. This chart shows the relationship between body fatness and non-basal energy expenditure. Now, a calorie is a calorie. So in most studies, diets result in more weight loss than exercise. This is a calorie of exercise equal to a calorie of diet restriction question. In a study by Ross et al., we saw a deficit of 700 kilocalorie per day diet through exercise or diet. Both treatments lost 16.5 pounds, exactly what was predicted. The exercise group lost more fat and actually preserved more muscle, however. There were similar results seen in another study, so equal caloric deficit through diet alone versus diet plus exercise. What we see in this graph is the pattern of caloric intake for rats versus the duration of exercise. Now if we look at the effects of exercise on appetite, most humans, the energy intake is increased across a broad range of energy expenditures. Also, this helps to maintain body weight. Now for a formerly sedentary individual, the net loss of appetite is, happens on an exercise program, which helps facilitate weight loss. These two graphs represent the pattern of caloric intake versus occupational activity. Continuing with exercise and body composition, we see that individuals who exercise generally have a lower body weight and percent fat. 
we see that weight loss in conjunction with exercise, that there is less lean body mass is lost, and more fat mass is lost as a result of the exercise. In general, those doing the largest amount of physical activity had the largest changes in percent body fat. In summary, humans increase appetite over a broad range of energy expenditures to maintain body weight. However, formerly sedentary individuals show a net loss of appetite and then they undertake an exercise program. When weight loss occurs with an exercise and diet program, less lean mass is lost than when the same weight loss is achieved by diet alone. Now looking at exercise weight loss and weight man maintenance, we see that weight loss that exercise contributes only to a small fraction of the weight loss. However, with weight maintenance, with light to moderate exercise, fats make up a large fraction of the energy expended. For moderate exercise, we see that it expends large amounts of fats and calories and the fitness to weight loss goals. Moving on to vigorous exercise, however, it is effective in expending calories and achieving fitness and fat loss goals. Successful losers. How much exercise is needed to keep the weight off? What we see is to maintain weight and prevent weight gain, 150 to 250 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise is needed. Now to achieve and to sustain weight loss, we need greater than 250 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. The National Weight Control Registry of Successful Losers shows an average weight loss of 33.6 kilograms for 5.2 years. There is no evidence of psychological distress, and the limited calorie intake of 1,400 kilocalories per day with 25% of the calories from fat and an expended 400 kilocalories per day through physical activity all have led to successful losers. Continuing, the strategy for long-term weight loss include high level of physical activity, limited television watching, low calorie, low fat diets, a consistent diet, breakfast consumption, dietary restraint, and self-monitoring. In summary, moderate intensity physical activity is an appropriate choice for most Americans to achieve health related and weight loss goals. Plasma free fatty acids make up a large fraction of the energy supplied for that level of physical activity. Also, moderate intensity physical activity promotes the expenditure of large amounts of fat and calories consistent with achieving weight loss and fitness goals. In addition, vigorous phys intensity physical activity is effective in expending calories and achieving fitness, performance, and weight loss goals. Looking at the table 18.6, we see the caloric cost for walking, jogging, and running. Also, table 18.7 shows us the estimated energy expenditure during exercise. These can be useful in counting your calories which will lead to successful weight loss during exercise. In summary, although 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity is associated with clear and significant health gains, more may be necessary to prevent weight gain, approximately 150 to 250 minutes per week, or prevent rate, weight regain after weight loss which is greater than 250 minutes per week. That concludes the content from chapter 18. I wanted to provide you with several study questions to help test your knowledge and help you learn at a different level. Question one, summarize the range of carbohydrate, fat, and protein intakes recommended by the Institute of Medicine. Two, what is the difference between the RDA standard and a daily value? Three, is there any risk in taking fat-soluble vitamins in large quantities? Explain. Four, which two minerals are believed to be inadequate in women's diets? Five, relative to coronary heart disease, why is there a major focus on dietary fat? Six, generate a one-week menu using the MyPlate website. How do your choices compare to those in the DASH eating plan? Seven, identify and describe the following methods of measuring body composition. Isotope dilution, potassium-40, ultrasound bioelectric impedance analysis, dual energy x-ray oxytometry, skin fold thickness, and underwater weighing. Eight, contrast the four component and two component models of body composition assessment. Nine, what is the principle of underwater weighing? Also, why should a different body density equation be used for children in contrast to adults? 10, given a 20 year old college male at 180 pounds and 28% body fat, what is his target body weight to achieve 17% body fat?
Number 11, in terms of the resistance to weight reduction, contrast obesity due to hypertrophy with obesity due to hyperplasia of fat cells. 12, is obesity more related to genetics or the environment? 13, if a person consumes 120 kilocalories per day in excess of need, what weight gain does the static energy balance equation predict compared to the dynamic energy balance equation? 14. What does the nutrient balance mean and how is the ratio of RQ to FQ used to determine nutrient balance? 15. Contrast the physiological set point with the behavioral set point related to obesity. 16. What happens to the BMR when a person goes on a low calorie diet? 17. What recommendations would you give about the use of diet alone versus a combination of diet and exercise to achieve a weight loss goal. 18. What is thermogenesis and how might it be related to weight gain? 19. What is the effect of exercise on appetite and body composition? 20. In contrast to the general physical activity recommendation for achieving significant health benefits, how much physical activity may be needed to prevent weight gain or maintain weight once it has been lost? This concludes Chapter 18 the Body Composition and Nutrition for Health. Please reference this lecture in your textbook for more information or to answer questions, or feel free to email me at any time. Thanks.